So, uh, so this is the second half of this interview, or the second half of this interview is being conducted on September 21st, uh, 2016 at Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is Victoria Marty, and I'm speaking with David Bud Besser. And uh, I just you. wanted to continue from the last week. Okay, thank you. Um, I know you gave uh, uh, just a really great overview of your experiences during the war the last time we spoke. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping to uh, talk a bit uh, you know, answer some of these other questions that are part of it. Okay. Um, okay, so could you tell me about your uh, boot camp and training experience, um, you know, being away from home, drill, instructor, uh, drill instructors, living conditions, lifestyle adjustments, that okay. sort of thing? All right. Um, my first camp was in uh, Pennsylvania near Harrisburg. And <laughs> forgive me, but I can't remember the name of it. But, we, but I was there, I was 18 years old at the time. <coughs> and it was uh, basic training, which was for 13 weeks. It was um, quite severe because it was a, the name, the, the kind of company was called was a port battalion. And what they did, it was part of the, um, well, I can't recall exactly what it was, but the, the, their job was, was putting uh, merchandise on and off to ships. And they worked in the cargo of the ships. And it was an awful job. But what we did is we trained from, uh, from in the morning until late in the afternoon. And then in the evening, we went down to, the, to a, we didn't have a real dock there in the middle of the country, but, but we went down to a ship. And we worked in the ship uh, just <laughs> taking boxes of cargo and putting them in the corner of the holes down below. And it was just to show you what kind of work you were going to do. Sure. Now this went on for 13 weeks. And considering that your basic training was seven or eight weeks, I mean se seven or eight weeks, seven was training, it was 13 weeks uh, from, from 8 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Then you'd have your dinner and then go and do this training for another two or three hours. Oh, really? OK. As far as the training went, the training was ex exceedingly good. Our officer was a 23-year-old lieutenant who had been in a military school, and he was uh, he was very very good at what he did. We had a, a company which is 120 men, and uh, we had three other officers. One, the company was divided in uh, three groups of 40 40 men each, okay. and. Um, and each, in each one of the four, each 40 group had one lieutenant uh, to lead it. Now, it was interesting because the men, you know, we were all quite young in those days. The men, maybe the officers were in their middle 20s. And we had one officer that was, it was interesting. He was uh, a very pleasant guy. And he, um, I, I remember more naturally when I first got out. But um, but I thought that the, the commanding officer, we all kind of griped about him and moaned about him because he was so rough and so tough. And the officer we had was so gentle. We thought, what a nice guy this gentle officer was. Three months later, when, when camp was over and we moved on to another base, um, the officer that was the rough, tough guy, he was in the barracks every day talking to us and just joking around. And a really sweet guy never showed up, never saw me. Really? I never saw him during the time. Mm -hmm. And it, it was just interesting, an observation of an 18-year-old sure. that was uh, um, under the, this military command for the first time. Mm -hmm. Now, we were in uh, Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania. It was in the hills of Indi Indian Gap, Indian Town Gap. And uh, two or three times a week, we would get, we'd go out in the mountains and just uh, just march in the mountains, which was um, which, which was quite a quite 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 a rough time. And we would go for maybe uh, five hours, six hours, wow. and sometimes we'd stay overnight. We had small pup tents that we would uh, put up. Pup tent could uh, serve two people, okay. and we would live in the pup tents for. Uh, at the time that we were out away from camp. Sure. Now, at Indian Town Gap, 
I really don't remember much. Um, uh, the location was um, near Harrisburg, which was the capital of um, Pennsylvania, which is the capital of Pennsylvania. And we were only about, um, what would I say, maybe about 100 miles from Philadelphia, okay. 100 miles from Washington. And um, we were always looking forward to the weekend when we would get away and uh, maybe go to one of these towns. But what was interesting was that the first couple of weeks we couldn't go because uh, they thought we might have something contagious. And as a result of it, they, we might catch something contagious. So they, they were un, we were under medical care for those first two weeks to make sure that uh, we wouldn't be giving anything to anybody. So we had to stay in camp. Huh. Okay. So the first week, we missed um, going outside. And because, and they took the group of men and by the alphabet, my name is Besser, so we did kitchen police most of the weekend. And um, because I was a B, <coughs> the ABCs were doing the kitchen police, and then the other men were doing other activities in the camp. Okay. Um, so we looked forward to the second week, and as uh, only the Army would have it by that time, but alphabet letter B came up again. And while we did KP every single day, by the time they got around to Besser again, Besser was uh, scheduled to uh, do KP again on the next Sunday. Oh, Saturday no. And, Sunday. <laughs> and uh, it was really disappointing. And it went on for, for two or three more weeks. We didn't get out of camp about the first month. Um, so a typical example of a camp. We had a corporal who had been in the old army, which was the army uh, that had served before in World War II. Okay. And uh, he was um, experienced in, in, in the military and knew his way around and was also a con man. He, was, he, was, he used to sleep in our barracks up, upstairs where, where we were sleeping. And uh, when we finally got a chance to go out for the weekend, just as he, we were about to leave, he says, hold on, fellas. He says, he says, the money has been taken from my wallet, and I've lost $35, and you guys aren't going out until you give me back $35. Oh, no. <laughs> well, this was typical of the old army. It never did happen. Uh -huh. But he wanted to get $35, and he figured it was worth it for us to chip in for a dollar or two apiece. And he would give us thirty-five dollars, then he'd let us go. Really? Wow. And we were we were infuriated. We knew that he was conniving or fooling yeah. around. Yeah. And finally, after about an hour or so, he finally let us go out. And there was no there was no theft. There was no money taken at all. Okay, so he basically just kind of refused. Oh yeah. Yeah. And this is the way it was. Did you? So do you remember going? Or did you go to Philadelphia? Did you go to Washington D.C.? I did. I, I I used to check to Philadelphia, but it was very easy getting a lift because I was in a military uniform, and people picked us up um, continuously. So you you basically hitchhiked there. Yeah. You stood on the side yeah. of the road with the right. Okay. <laughs> the same thing going to Washington. What's the, uh, so? What was? Do you remember some of the the riots with the people that picked you up? I mean, uh, talking with you or asking questions or. No, I, it's interesting though. That's a good question. I remember one woman. Uh, she said, "Where did you go to school?" And I said, "Chicago." And she said, "You know, how did you? How how far did you get to school?" I said, "I was going to college." And she says, "Well, I thought you did because I noticed by the way you speak." And it really was a lot of baloney. But I was I was impressed by the fact that the woman knew that I, I had gone on to school. And it's surprising that I would remember this to tell you. Was she by herself when she? she yeah, she she picked me up huh. just like everybody else did. Okay. So how often did you, did you go? Uh, after, I know uh, you know it wasn't every, in the beginning. It didn't. It wasn't every week. You weren't really able to leave the camp in the no. beginning, but towards the no, end. No, but guess. in the first uh, the first few weeks we uh, you know, we would try to get away as much as we could. Would, when you got to, to Philly, I mean, would, were you, would you stick together? Would you meet up, or would you kind of do your own thing? Uh, 
I don't remember. I, I would say for the most part it was on my own. Okay. Did you have friends in Philly or D.C.? Or yeah, well, I, I came down from Camp Grant with a couple of fellows that I had met there, and we were quite friendly. Okay. Um, what was the scene in, in the cities? I mean, um, you know, of course everyone knew the war was going on, you know. Yeah, yeah. What was, uh, can you describe? Well, what? in Philadelphia, you know, you, you do, you know, you go see the bell. Okay. And, um, and there was some nightclubs that they had that were quite famous. Uh, and you went down into the basement of a building, and that's where the club was. And I remember, I think I met one there a couple times when I to Philadelphia. You like jazz, I remember. Hmm? You like jazz, I remember. That's right. You got a good memory. Did you see some jazz clubs there? Is that what you were looking for? or? Not necessarily. Okay. I'm just looking for entertainment. Sure, you know. sure. Well, did they have soldiers protecting some of the landmarks at, the, at that time? Uh, I don't there? think so. Not in the state, United States very much. Okay. Though I had, quite honestly, um, about a year later I was in Florida. And I was in Tallahassee. I was in Tallahassee. I came up for the weekend. And um, I was walking down the street. And all of a sudden there were three soldiers coming the opposite direction and passing me by, and they were in German uniforms. Really? And uh, I started laughing, and there were a couple of MPs behind them. And the MP says, he says, what's so funny, and why didn't you, you stop and, and tell us about these men? And so I said, because it's, because, because it's kind of hokey here. If there's there's 5,000 Americans in uh, Tallahassee today, yeah. and there's three German soldiers walking down the street with two MPs behind them. Obviously, they didn't escape. Right, sure. They were, they were prisoners of war. Really? And they were stationed down in Florida at the time. Huh. Um. Do you remember what those guys, uh, their condition of their uniforms or their no. their physical, their physique or anything no, like that? No, they might have been under prisoner of war uniforms, but I don't remember what they were. Huh. And, uh, and, and, the, and the, they, they, were, they were always testing people, testing us uh, through the war. And, uh, well, they were just testing to see what our reaction would be, seeing these these German soldiers walking down the street. What? Now, there were some pretty bad things that went on down in the South. Yeah. Um, there, were <coughs> prison, there were a lot of prisoners of war, especially a lot of Italians, I think, were mm -hmm. down South because the Italians came from a warm climate. Okay. And uh, subsequently, Florida's being warm, they sent them down to the prisoner of war camps down there. Really? Okay. Now, what was interesting about it was that, and I didn't have the experience, but I read about it then, was that um, the American soldiers were segregated in those days. Was, there was no integrated uh, organizations at the time. Mm -hmm. And the soldiers that were African Americans, black in those days as we call them, sure. they were, um, <clears throat> they would get on the bus like everybody else, mm -hmm. and they made them go up to the back of the bus. Really? So that even though they were in uniform, they made them go on the back of the bus just like they did in civilian life. Mm -hmm. Okay. And not only were there white soldiers in front of them, but if there were German prisoners of war that were on the bus, they too were in front of them. Really? And that's the way it was in those days. Wow. I, I'd never... And, and, we, and we were segregated in... Uh, in the camp to our own uh, uh, barracks. And there were only uh, African Americans in, in uh, their barracks and whites in our bar barracks. Were you able and, and the integrating of troops really wasn't until after the war. Yeah. And President Truman did it in 1946, 47, something like that. Okay. Were you, I mean, I know you were segregated and you had a very, you know, um, uh, controlled life there in the military, but mm -hmm. were you able to, to talk with any of the, the African American soldiers? I mean, were you able to oh, sure. socialize at all? Sure. Sure. There was no problem there. Yeah. Um, but when I was in Belgium, after, um, when I got <coughs> overseas, 
Um, a lot of these soldiers had seen combat, and, and most of them weren't in combat, but they drove trucks and, uh, and, and went down into the combat areas, and many of them were killed in the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, when they came back, came back home, they were treated just like they were, had been before. Yeah, it's really shameful. Um, yeah. uh, there was a famous, uh, there was a famous uh, uh, Air Force group that was the first uh, uh, African Americans to fly. Oh, the Tuskegee. The Tuskegee. Yeah. I think in Alabama. They were. Yeah. And uh, and they they had the best record of any uh, Air, Air Force group uh, in World War Two in bombings and in uh, accidents and being killed. I don't think one was killed. And they were sent into combat many, many times when they were flying. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's really impressive. Yeah. Um, um, but wait, let's see. In the basic camp, I really can't tell you much more about it. Was it different? I, I had one fellow who came down with me from Camp Grant. Okay. <laughs> and this was typical. We were we were in uh, we were in the barracks together one time, and I, and I was teasing him and nailing him, and he went after me, and he put his hands around my throat. Oh no! And he says, "I never told you." He says, "But I, I killed somebody in civilian life." You're kidding! Oh my gosh! <laughs> and. Uh, but those are, you know, those were people you never met before. Right. And they came from, from all different kind of groups. What happened to that? I mean, nothing. He, 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 was, he jumped on top of me and then I pushed him off or something. Wow. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I just, I mean, that's one question, you know, I mean, you were, um, you really, it's so many different people that you'd never met before and you're all coming oh, together yeah. and you're working together. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, like most 18 year olds, you know, we did that much experience. And uh, because of it, um, we met people from everywhere, from Southerners, and, you know. And, but as I said, we didn't meet anybody of, whose skin was a different color. Did you, um, you, you haven't talked um, very much about your, um, you know, I know you, you uh, grew up on the south side of Chicago. Yeah. Um, you haven't talked too much about your family life, but were you, uh, do you have siblings or? Um I've got a, I had a sister. Okay. And, um, and my dad was uh, in his late 40s at the time when he went away. Okay. But in our family, uh, my brother-in-law, <coughs> my sister's husband was uh, over in Europe for uh, three years. Okay. And I had an uncle who was about 15 years older than me, and he was he went to the, into the Pacific, and we lived together in the same building, so so we were quite quite close. Did they? Uh, did your brother-in-law and your uncle? Did they survive? Did they come back? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fortunately, none of us were. Hurt. Okay, well, that's that's good. Did you did you keep in touch with uh, with some of the the people that you yeah, met? Yeah, but we had what was called V-mail. Okay. And, and it was uh, an, an envelope which opens up and you would write on the on the inside. Okay. And then you would fold it and close it. Sure. But the censors then had to read it before they would send it out. And um, so if you wrote about something that was secretive, they would scratch it out. And if you, you might have said something about the officers that you didn't like, and they'd scratch it out too. Sure. And the same thing with the mail that came in. Yeah. The letters that came in were uh, also censored before we got them. What, did you um, keep in touch after you got out of the service? Did you yeah. keep in touch with some of the, the men that you met? Uh, one of the fellows I came back with, that. I was out in California and I was out with him a couple of times. That was about a... Okay. Um, no, it was... There was nobody that I retained a relationship with. Sure. I know you talked a little bit about, um, yeah. towards the end of the last interview, about um, joining a veterans organization. There was one that oh, you, yeah. you chose not to be I part did, of. I, I, I had an uncle who was a professional joiner, I think. He was, <laughs> he, he, he was in World War One, and he belonged to the American Legion. He was very active in the Legion. Okay. So. Uh, I used to joke and say, 
when we got off the uh, boat, as we jumped off the boat, the Mer American Legion was waiting for you right, right <laughs> off the boat. But uh, <coughs> they t he tried to get me to join, and I, I, I wouldn't do it. And I didn't join any group. It was, uh, there was a Jewish war of veterans, and Catholic war of veterans, Protestant war of veterans. And I, I didn't like that idea, because we, we weren't, uh, you know, we weren't segregated in the army that way, so I didn't see why we should do it in, uh, in civilian life either. Right. Um, um, yeah, uh, we, let me um, go through some of, the, some of the other questions here. Yeah. Um, uh, did, did, you know, you, you talked about V-mail. Um, yeah. You, and I asked you about communicating with, with other soldiers that you had met oh, with. Oh, yeah, sure. Would you, with your family, family, were your parents sending you letters? I mean, or oh, sure, sure. Friends? Or, a lot know? of people that I grew up with, too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you still have some of those those letters? No, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. What's, um, uh, when, you were, uh, when you were first drafted, you know, I mean, I know there was, there was this, you know, obviously the context of the war. Mm -hmm. um, you, uh, from what you you were hearing other people say and reading in newspapers, hearing on the radio, that sort of thing, um, did you feel some pressure or stress? I mean, was it? Uh, I know there was an expectation, you know, a requirement you were drafted there, but um, what was it like? Um, you know, knowing that there was pressure and so forth. Well, uh, you know. You, you, you most likely heard of, of other people being killed, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, mm -hmm. what, what were some? Do you remember how you felt at the time? Well, uh, I got. I was after just 13 weeks. I went to the air cadets in the air cadet program, and I remember one of the fellows that, and we lived in dormitory at Gettysburg College, and um, I remember one time when one of the fellows on the floor. Uh, was crying, and we and I asked one of the fellows. I said, "What's his problem?" And he said, "Just he just found out that his brother was was missing in in World War II." Mm -hmm. And I'm sure those things happen once in a while, but uh, but there was uh, no, no no particular pressure that I recall. Okay. Yeah, it's um. But, I mean, but again, it this is the way the war was. I grew up with a fellow named Bobby Feldman, and uh, we were in grammar school and high school together, and we went in the Army the same day, and um, we were at Camp Grant, which is just outside Chicago on the north side, okay. and um, while we were there, we lined up to get our Army serial number, and my number was, say, the, the end of my number was 94, and his number was 97. And what they did then is they drew a line between our names. And I went to Pennsylvania, and Bobby went to Texas. He went, went to the, the 36th Texas Division, and we went in, in May, on May 20th, and I got a letter in uh, January from one of my friends that said he was killed in action. And his entire outfit was was washed out, was was eliminated. They um, they had a terrible war in Italy at the time, and at the time the um, Americans were invading Anzio Beach, which was in Italy, and but but they were coming off the water, and Anzio was on the, right on the uh, uh, not the ocean, but the water that was came alongside Italy. No, it might have been the Mediterranean. And um, because of that, <clears throat> General Clark, who was the head of the troops in Italy, um, was leading the 36th Division, which is where my friend was in, and they were coming down in the middle of Italy. And what he wanted them to do is continue to come down to Italy, closer to Anzio Beach, and it would pull some of those German soldiers off of the beach, so they couldn't uh, they couldn't fight against the the boys that were coming off the water. Okay. So they came into the middle of Italy, where the 36th Division was, and the Germans were up on a hill, 
um, just waiting for the Americans to come over a bridge one time, and they were at the Rapido River. And my friend, along with everybody in the regiment, which I'm talking about maybe 5,000 soldiers, were, as far as I know, eliminated and went across the river. Because the Germans were just waiting for them, and they completely wiped out the outfit. And my friend was one of them. I'm sorry. And uh, I've read about it several times. And uh, it, w it must have been an anarchy, because the soldiers were going over the water. They were just going over a small river or lake. And as they were going over, uh, the Germans were just waiting for them and were picking them off when they were even in the, in the little rowboats that were going across. Mm -hmm. And the boats had bullet holes in them, and the boats kept on going, coming across and picking up the soldiers that had to go across right. the water. Right. And they did it over and over and over again. And finally, some of the soldiers realized that they weren't coming back, and they refused to cross. And as a result of it, uh, it was terrible anarchy, because here they were in a, a war, it was nighttime, and they were trying to get them in the boats to cross, and some of the good boys wouldn't go. Right. And the reason they wouldn't go is because they were told that the guys on the other side were killed. Was, they, those things happened throughout the war, and it was horrible. And is the, the reason I tell you about my friend is because he was 97 and I was 94. I, 94 went to Pennsylvania, 97 went to Texas. Yeah. And because they were all eliminated, I was lucky that I wasn't one of them. And I suppose I had been standing where he was, and he was standing where I was. Yeah. And that was, that happened uh, more than once. I'm sorry, yeah, it's, um, I'm sorry about your friend, you know, that's... Um, oh, it, it was just shocking, you know. Yeah. And, um, interestingly, um, you know, we knew lots of people when we were kids. And I never met anybody um, from Chicago while I was there until right after the war, I went back to London. And while I was there, I met one of the, the fellows that I grew up with. Oh. And, five, and we were in um, a square in London. Have you heard of Trafalgar? Yeah, sure. And it was right back Trafalgar. And, um, Did you run in by accident? And I, and or I ran, ran into him. Okay. And five minutes later, we ran into another one. Really? Yeah, for, it was 18, we'd been on, in the Army for 18 months. What, do you remember what, when was this? It were, well, it would be in 1945, Okay. right after the war, because the war in Europe ended in, um, um, in April or May of 45, and then the war ended in August of 45. Okay. In Japan, when they dropped the nuclear bombs. Was this when you were in, uh, I know you, you talked about going to London for training for school. Yeah, I was, uh, I was in France, and what we were in training for is they were training us to go to Japan. We were in, we were at the Rhine River when we, in April, April 12th, we were, in 1945, we were in the Rhine River, right by the Rhine River, waiting to cross it. Okay. And, um, and, and, and we did cross it. They knocked the bridge out of the in Remagen, in Belgium, I think it was, and they and they built a pontoon bridge to replace it. And we went across the river in the uh, pontoon bridge, and it really was the first time that I really wasn't in the action, except a, a machine going off when we were there. Really. And so I realized, I suppose this is what action's all about. But how, I really hadn't seen much. How close was it? I mean, do you... Probably well, uh, maybe a hundred yards. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. um, and that was uh, from the... Uh, yeah. But, oh, and then what we did is we, um, we came back from the Rhine River, and they took the 18 and the 19-year-olds out of the army, not, not out of the army, but out of the ac action at, at the Rhine River, and returned us to uh, to France, right near Paris, where there were where there were camps. So they were training, uh, just giving you basic training again, and they were going to send us to Japan oh, okay. because because they figured that we were that, uh, we were going to invade Japan, and if there's an invasion of Japan like it was in uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, they said there could be a million boys that are going to be killed here because it was such a difficult job of invading Japan.
because American soldiers had to go, come from across the river, across the river. They had to cross the ocean maybe a hundred miles before they got to Japan from the nearest the base that they were at. Mm -hmm. As opposed to in Europe, we were only about 40 miles from France. And so it was very easy to cross from England to France. Sure. But, it, but um, the, because they anticipated there were going to be tremendous uh, um, number of people that were going to be injured and killed, they were preparing us to go to Japan. Do you, how, do you remember how long that, be, that when you redid the well, basic I, training? Well, well, I was there in, uh, about in, in May, and I was there until about September, and then I went up to Berlin. Okay. It was until September 45, and so right. then to Berlin. Um, oh, I, what was interesting about it, the reason I remember April 12th is because Franklin Roosevelt died on April 12th. Correct. Okay. And... Uh, we got on the trucks to go back to France. And in one day we drove, because they were all close together, we drove through Belgium and Luxembourg and got into France that same, all that same day, April 12th. And what interested me was the fact that there were flags at half mass for Roosevelt in all those foreign countries. That is impressive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was very, very impressed about that. But Roosevelt was, was really more than just the president of the United States. What's, what was it, I know you, you, you talked about um, getting a, a radio, and I've, I know... Um, oh, it just, when I went up to Berlin, we took over the, the Germans, um, the SS troopers had individual homes that they stayed in when they were in, in Berlin. Okay. And when, when we got to Berlin, um, the war was over. But when we got there, we were, we were put in, the, in these homes. And... Uh, here I was just a private, and I was living in a, a three or th a three bedroom home. Really? And um, was it just you, or did you? Well, there were three of us, but two of the fellows went home after we got there, and I was by myself. Do you remember what this home was like? I mean, you said it was a three bedroom home. What, it was part of the American well, sec it, section of. Uh, yeah, it, it, there was you know a barbed wire around the section. But it was about four or five, a little more than that, maybe a mile square. Okay. And um, would you take a, a, a truck to and from the home to uh, to the office, or no? Well, the, on the base there, there were, there were several uh, large buildings, and I wound up. Um, it was who's trained you? We uh, we used to wake up at six o'clock in the morning when we got there, and at six thirty, my day was over. It was crazy. And so, the fellow was the first sergeant, and I would leave about 9, 10 o'clock, and we'd go in town. And there were a few restaurants in Berlin that were still alive. Okay. So we'd go in and get breakfast or something. And this first sergeant, he was a rather shy man. And we were walking down the street, and only, as only you would do it in, over in Europe, you wouldn't do it in the United States. But I saw the German girl across the street, and I says, I said, uh, uh, what, what do you call the German? What do you call the Germans? Uh, oh, uh, I don't speak German. Um, doing um, Fraulein. Fraulein. That's I said. Okay. I said Fraulein. I says, come and sit here. So she crossed the street, and I says, Fraulein. I said, I'd like you to meet my my friend, Sergeant Jones. Sergeant, this is what's your name? Fraulein. With a sniff. <laughs> and I said, Sergeant Jones, this is Fraulein Smith. A little while ago, he, he was about 10 years older than me, and uh, he went home before I did. And uh, after he left, I hadn't seen him anymore, I didn't even think about it anymore. And I went to Champagne to go to school in right. Illinois. Right. And I'm walking down the street one day, and who should be walking down the street but the sergeant? Really? And he was about 30, so there were a lot of soldiers that were quite a bit older than going to school. He was about 30, 35 years old. So he says, we got to have you over for dinner. And I says, we got to have you over for dinner. I said, you married? And he says, yeah. I says, well, I'd be glad to come. He says, you know who I married? And I says, no. He says, that's all I need to You're kidding. <laughs> so you were a matchmaker. Isn't that a funny story? Yeah, that's great. <laughs>
So they, they, they basically they had never met before that he just he just saw that he thought no. she was attractive and you were a, a lot of German girls, a lot of European yeah. girls don't want to come to the United States. Sure, sure, yeah. They, they would marry anybody just to come over to the United States. Well, I mean are they still married? Are they still together? But well, uh, I was, uh, that was 1946. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, but that's, uh, I mean, you know, uh, so you, you, you were a pretty confident guy then at that, at that time to be able to, to just walk up to this, this lady you never met to, to introduce. And it, it, when we were overseas, we were, we were quite different than in the States. In the States, it was uh, much more um, militarized and over there, just about anything went. Mm -hmm. um, We were talking about. I had asked you about the, the three bedroom home that you were living oh, yeah. in, the section of, uh, of Berlin, uh, the American section. I asked you if you were um, kind of a, you know, how you got oh, yeah. from the home oh, where you yeah. were living to the office. Well, what I did, what, so anyways, when I was in Berlin, and we didn't do anything after going into town for about a couple of weeks like that, I, I was just bored. And and. Um, a military term that I, I've always given to the younger people that I've met through the years that go out and serve as members of my family. I says, never volunteer, ever. But the, I thought, the heck with it, I'm going to volunteer and try to get myself a job because, because I, I, can't, I can't sit around all day long like this. Mm -hmm. So I went up to the, we in Berlin was the head of the troops for all of Europe, just like Eisenhower was before sure. the war was over. General Lucius Clay was in a building, and I went up to his office, and he was the head of the troops, all the American troops in Europe. And, uh, and I told him, I said, I said, uh, I said, my background, I says, I can write fairly quite well, and I'd like to uh, guess maybe the public relations department. And they said, sure, and they put me in right away. And I think I might have told you last night. Yeah, time. yeah. And we wrote uh, news releases for the for, Soldiers that were in Berlin and sent them to their home newspapers. Sure. And um, in my case, I had a very important job. Everybody in the public relations department was an officer except me. And I was a private, a PFC. And I lost my PFC if I, I did something wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I'd get it back six months later. But when I was in uh, Berlin, they gave me a very important job. They said, take these messages. Oh, Berlin was divided into, into four countries. Maybe I told you this right, before. Right, four, four sections, yeah. And maybe I even told you the story. Well, it's okay. No, it's, it's but, okay. And, but anyways, uh, they said, go get, a, get an automobile and get a chauffeur and go down into to the uh, English part, or the Russian part, or the French part of uh, Germany with, the, with this package of papers. So I said, okay, thank you. So I got in the car, and at times it was the general's car. And on, a, on the side of the general's car was a big star. Uh -huh. So here I am, the private sitting in the back seat, while the chauffeur, the American, it was a German civilian driving. And he'd drive me in his truck. And as I went out of the, the base where the, where the uh, offices was, uh, all the soldiers would come to attention because my car had a big star on it. Right. So I would open up the window and I'd go by. They they well, they probably thought, who the hell is this guy trying to pass through the car? And I thought it was so funny, and they probably thought I was just plain stupid. But but uh, but I did it many times. So go to one one place, the Russians, and, and it was um, a lot better than just sitting around the house. Sure, day. sure. What was it when we, when you were interacting with? Yeah. Um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, military personnel from these other yeah. sections. What was it like? Um, I quite honestly don't remember. It was anything special. We had met to, we had, it seems to me, <laughs> and there are so many stories from the war, I, I'm not sure that that happened to me, but we, we went over the river that I was telling you about, uh -huh. and after about going another 25, 30 miles, we bumped into the Russians coming the other way. Huh. And what the Russians used to do, they used to see a watch on their hand, and they said, jewels, jewels, jewels meant jewels. Oh. And what they wanted to see, the inside of the watch, and if it had any kind of a jewel inside, or a, a colored, colored stone, huh. they wanted to buy it. Oh, okay. 
So the American soldiers were going over with three or four watches at times. <laughs> and, the, and the Russians, the Russians hadn't got paid for five years probably. Right. They, funded, they finally had some money. Sure. So they were buying the watches all the time. And so that's how we got to talking to them anyways. Yes. You know, and I couldn't speak, speak too much English. Good enough to get, get by. Were there interpreters? Did, did, the, did you interact with the... Oh, I'm sure there were. Yeah. I don't recall and I don't remember. I, you know, um, speaking of kind of, um, uh, you know, making money off of items that, that were bought and sold, I mean, you talked about the cigarette cases, the cigarettes, oh, the yeah. cartons of cigarettes that, yeah. that you'd buy. Yeah. Um, was, um, was there any, what else could you, do you remember of the, the black market that was going on at the, at the time? Well, I was interested in the cigarettes because, you know, because I made a lot of money doing it. And um, I, I managed them with a lot of different things. That they'd sell anything at all, you know. Sure. And uh, you know what was interesting about it was, <coughs> you know, the Germans, as badly as as, um, as the other troops in the other countries got uh, many, many casualties. I think America lost, the United States lost over 400, what was it, 400,000 people? It was some huge figure like that. They were killed in World War II. Mm -hmm. 400,000, that sounds like an awful lot. But we had, we had 15 million people in service. And out of the 15 million, yeah, I guess 400,000 might have been, and 400,000 soldiers were killed, or wounded, probably. And, um, you know, oh, and if this happens with the United States, there were millions of Germans that were killed because the Ru Germans were on the Russian side fighting, they were fighting the British and the right. French and the Americans. Sure. And they're doing the same thing down in Italy and we were in France. Right. So they were, they they might have in fact I, I think that the Germans probably lost a generation at that time. Oh, yeah. And um why I'm telling why am I telling you this? Oh we were talking because, about because because they were selling everything they had. Right. Like those who came back, and even those who were civilians, mm -hmm. they would be selling everything. And, you know, they were hungry. They couldn't get food. When, when we were in one, in the, one of the camps in, in France, even, uh, we would eat out, outdoors and buffet style. Mm -hmm. We would bring our canteens around and our trays, right. and they put food in it. And then, as only Americans would do, we wasted it out of it and throw it in the garbage can. Mm -hmm. And there would be dozens of Frenchmen waiting for us to throw it in the garbage can. And then they'd run over to the garbage can and take it out. Sure, yeah. And it's the same thing with the Germans. Yeah. It, was, it was just as bad with them. I had no sympathy for them, but it still was terrible. Yeah, it's, uh, talk about the, uh, the malnutrition. You yeah. know, it, I know after the war it took quite some time for oh, people sure. to... Oh, sure. So, you know, but I'm sure the Germans... Oh, okay. I remember the Germans um, who, you know, I mean, there were Germans that lived well through the war. And I remember there used to be Germans who, they would have beautiful old overcoats with velvet uh, uh, necks uh -huh. or fur around the necks right. and dressed right. just beautifully. And here they were in the black market selling their personal belongings. Really? Yeah. And, um, Well, oh, that's no, that's okay. I mean, yeah. you, you, um, the uh, I wonder if you could talk a little bit. I mean, you lived yeah. in that home. You, you were talking about how the SS soldiers had taken over these homes in yeah. Berlin, and then you know uh, you moved into one of those homes. Um, was it? Uh, you know, could you talk about the condition of that home or the other homes you might have gone into? Were they well, in they, good shape or were they? Yeah, they were. They were in excellent shape. We had a, a woman come in every day and clean the place, and uh, we were really, really treated quite well. But that's because we were in Berlin, and that, that was really the headquarters for all of Europe at that time, right, right after the war. Yeah. And uh, so we were treated quite well. Was that considered part of the base, the home that you were on? Did they, because they had to build, you know, right. establish kind of... It's like, um, it would be like maybe being downtown, or right near downtown where there were some large buildings, because the offices had, you know, there were dozens of offices there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, the soldiers would be phoning from all over the country 
and all over the Europe, matter of fact. Yeah. It's asking for questions and so forth and what they should do. Okay. So, um, but as far as the houses went, it was, an, as I said, an area maybe a mile square. Okay. And, and then down the block, a couple blocks with the, these high, these buildings are maybe three or four stories high, and we're all offices in them. Hmm. Was it, you know, um, uh, you talked about uh, with some of the money that um, you made from selling cigarettes, you'd go out to uh, to, to nice, uh, some, eat some, some nice meals. Some oh, some yeah, meals. yeah. Was I spent $100 for a meal. Okay. Because I yeah. couldn't get the money home. Sure. And what they said to me was that the only money you can get home is the money that you've gotten paid while you were in Europe. Really? So we hadn't gotten paid for most of the time we were in Europe before the war was over. Uh -huh. So as a result of it, we just went back and said, well, we were overseas for 16 months, got paid X amount of dollars. So 16 times X is how much money we got paid. Right. But um, they only allowed us to take that much home. And I was only, I took, I think I sent home about $2,000. And uh, there were many people, officers, that, that uh, wouldn't be selling cigarettes. Mm -hmm. But when they heard that you uh, had money, they said that um, if you'd give me so much money, I'll, I'll make sure that you can send more than that home. Okay. And, uh, you know, I was too proud to, 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 to give them money in order for them to do that. Yeah. And I was foolish because I, may, I think I grossed about $10,000. And I sent home two, so for eight thousand dollars, I just wasted. Well, but didn't you? You, you told me that you, when you yeah, came home, you used some of that money to support you when you were in college or to finish your degree. Yeah, it, it took me through college. Yeah, I didn't yeah. have that, but I had the GI Bill, so you know. Right. And they paid me sixty-five dollars a month for a board and room, mm -hmm. and then and I had this nine, this uh, two thousand dollars that I kept all the way through summer until until I got through school. Right. Did you keep that money with you at all times? I mean, was it, I mean, I would, uh, you know. No, 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 maybe, I, I would think that, uh, I know one time I, I had, um, I got $400 for something, and we were t in train, basic training in France, as I said, mm -hmm. and uh, the officer in charge of our, our captain, poor guy, he was, uh, had a terrible heart, he couldn't hear, because this, he was, he was in areas that were bombed and, and there was so much ammunition that bombed into his ear almost, and he couldn't hear. Yeah. And when we were standing at attention at 5 o'clock at, at uh, retreat, um, every, all the other troops around would be standing at attention or holding their guns up like this. Right. And we were just standing there because he couldn't, he couldn't hear, hear the trumpet that was blowing at the time oh until one of us would tell him. Yeah. And, and he told us when we first got to camp, he says, there's soldiers coming in and out of this camp every day. And let me tell you ahead of time, I'm, if you should lose anything, if you lose anything at all, don't come to me and start crying. He says, I'm warning you ahead of time. Well, we went out for basic training those days. We were doing it over again. Mm -hmm. We were running out into the field, and I remember I had $400 that I put at the bottom of my barracks bag. Yeah. And when... Uh, we got back back from uh, the training. When we went back into the barracks, there was my barracks bag oh. upside down. Oh, you're kidding. And everybody else's barracks bags when they were upside down. And somebody that stuck around yeah. stole, stole oh, the money yeah. that was there. I so I went, I, went over, yeah, I went over to the captain and uh, I thought the hell with I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to let him know what he did. Right. And I said, you did something terrible. I said, you gave these guys an opportunity to do this because if you said for us not to come to you and, and they got the money, nobody's going to do anything about it. Right, yeah. So I went over and told them. And I, I thought that he could get angry at me, you know, this pride of talking to a captain like this. But he, he would come out and he, and he apologized. Huh. <laughs> I was surprised. Well, no, you're right, though. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, there's no one's going to be held accountable. Though, That's right. You know, um, Except that you didn't, you weren't supposed to do this to an officer, no matter what they did. Yeah. You saw them screw up, so they screwed up. Yeah. Well, as, you know, um, it, it was a hectic time, obviously. Oh, and, yeah. And, you know, a lot going on. Oh, and, sure. And you, you were probably weren't the only uh, oh, yeah. uh, well, member who was... Oh, yeah. dozens of... In fact, we all did, you know. Yeah. You had nowhere to put the money. You couldn't put it in your pocket. Yeah, we're Because you'd be running around and... 
and you'd be, be going under barbed wire and so forth, and the money sure. would fall out. Well, so, you know, that's a question I've always had yeah. um, with these, these uniforms, and, and I know you, ha you likely had different uniforms, maybe depending on different, you know, I, I know nothing about the military, but if you're, if you're in basic training, yeah. it's going to be a different uniform. Yeah, yeah. Do you have po did you have pockets with, like, uh, yeah, some buttons? Big, big, or big pockets. But did they have the buttons? Like, or could you close the pockets? Or? Well, they were just closed for, you know, running around in the mud and so forth. Okay. They weren't clothes that you wore when you went out. When you, you know, for the officers that were uh, in combat, yeah. what were, did they, I mean, did they have... Well, uh, they, they, they might dress as you did, it, but they would have their, their bars on their shoulder or stars if they were, you know, generals or colonels even. Mm -hmm. But um, the officers and the men pretty much were dressed alike when they were in the war itself. Okay. Okay. But for, I mean, places where they could they could put a letter or something that, or um, something of value to them. Um, I don't remember that at all. Okay. No. Okay. Um, Good question. Let's, uh, did you, uh, here's one of these questions, but now, sure. when you were off duty, I know you talked a lot about, um, you know, you went to, to London, you went, to, you were in uh, Paris. Were there, were there any USO shows, anything, any uh, performances? In the States, I saw a USO show. Oh, you did? Okay. And there was a, um, there was a famous uh, movie star named Orson Welles. Oh, yeah. And yeah. he was there, and, uh, and the woman, I think was his wife, was Rita Hayworth, her name was. Okay. And she was, very, they were very famous uh, movie stars, and I saw them in the USO out of Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, really? Overseas, I don't think so. I don't think I saw any, but there, there were a lot of people overseas. Right. Now, okay. there was Frank Sinatra, was uh, very popular in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, for reasons which, which I, he was, he was, he was, he was a, uh, <laughs> he was a very likable guy and he was a very nasty guy. And for some reason or other, he was angry at the army, and he wouldn't go overseas. And he was a civilian. He got out going in the army, and he and they wanted him to go overseas and, and sing for the troops, and he refused to go really? because he was angry at something or other. Mm -hmm. But um, we we had lots of people that were who were overseas. There was a woman who was a, a German back in the 1920s, and she came over to the United States and became a, a famous movie star. And um, she was one, one, I was at some kind of a entertainment meeting, but she was, she was there, and she, I don't know if she sang or not, but she, she, was, she was the main feature. And if I, if I told you her name, uh, you probably wouldn't know, but your family probably would. Very famous woman. I can't remember what her name was. I Marlene Dietrich. Marlene Dietrich. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, I was, you know, you, you listened yeah. to the radio. Like, did you hear? You, you love jazz. Yeah. You, what was the, what, what was on the radio at the time when you were in uh, in Europe? If you remember. Well, um, there were you know during during the war there were a lot of comedians that were on. There was no television, uh -huh. so people like Bob Hope and um, let's see. Bob Hope, Bing Crosby, who was a singer. Okay. And um, let's let me think. Well, there were a lot of comedians that were around in those days. I don't, I don't know if the names mean anything to you. There was a man named Edwin Wynn and Eddie Cantor. I've heard of Eddie Cantor. Did you? Okay. Yeah. And um, and in. in in the 40s and the early 50s, in the 30s and 40s, there were big bands, mm -hmm. big 20-piece bands, orchestras, that were um, in the United States. And then uh, they created big bands overseas from a lot of these fellows that went in service. And one of the most famous of the orchestra leaders that went in service is a man named Glenn Miller. Oh, right. And Glenn Miller's... Um, <laughs> I was a Glenn Miller fan, and I, and I found out they were in Paris, and I went into Paris, and um, and I was with the band while I went to one place, 
And then they got to jump on a bus to go somewhere else, and I jumped on the bus with them and went to another place. The Glenn place. Miller band? You were with the Glenn Miller band? Yeah. Oh, really? Just, just going around with them. <laughs> wow. But, but, but I was just crazy for Glenn Miller. Did you talk yeah, to him? Or did, did you? No, I don't remember doing that. Okay. And, and what happened to him is he, he was in England. This was in England at the time. Okay. And um, he, went, he went in a small plane. His band went over to uh, France, and he was going over there. And he got lost, and you never heard from him again. Really? Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Now, you're a big girl, so I'll tell you this story. Okay. <laughs> One of the stories I heard is he did go overseas, but he wound up in a house of prostitution. Oh, no. And he was married. And they didn't want to, they didn't want to say that's where, that's where he found <laughs> out. <laughs> but but other, others say it. So they said that he went down on the, uh, in the channel, in the, in the canal between the, France and right, the English uh, Channel, yeah. The English Channel. Yeah, huh. The English Canal. Well, um, yes, um, I... Now, don't you write that about No, it will Like, club <laughs> because, because his wife might still be around. Um, we, uh, what we're going to do, I, and I don't know if Neil and I told you this, but at the end, 